one issue, two points of view. Agora. In Brussels, EU commissioners, intellectuals and journalists joined the following discussion. Is multiculturalism a bridge or a barrier to intercultural dialogue? In other words, can speaking more than two languages help or hinder EU citizens in their daily lives? The answer might seem obvious, but some say it isn't. Leonard Orban is the EU Commissioner for Multilingualism. He's Romanian and speaks four languages. Shada Islam is a journalist who heads the European Policy Centre in Brussels. She's originally from Pakistan and is also multilingual. In this edition of Agora, they discuss why, in such a diverse Europe, languages should be a bridge, but that national identity, businesses and the fear of English only can also be barriers to multilingualism. I would say automatically it's a bridge. The more languages you speak, the more you reach out to the other person and the more you connect with each other and create an inclusive society. So I was in fact quite puzzled by the fact that this could be a barrier. I think we all in Europe realize that we live in a very diverse society and this linguistic diversity is something we should cherish and nurture. Would you say that it can ever be a barrier? Uh, no, and uh, I fully agree with you, but uh, it is not so obvious everywhere. Mm. It's sometimes uh, this uh, diversity is seen as a threat for the society. Mm. So our role is to demonstrate mm. and to promote this such kind of uh, society. Mm -hmm. Very soon we will uh, present a new strategy for, mul uh, for multilingualism. And one of the aim of this strategy will be exactly like this to show that multilingualists can contribute to a, a social cohesion, to a more cohesive uh, Europe. Because I think, you know, I came to Europe when I was 18 years old and I came here speaking basically one language, uh, my mother tongue, which was Urdu and English. And I learned French and then I learned Spanish and now I can converse in many languages. And I think that really did help me to integrate. So I think what we need to do is explain to people that multilingualism is actually a factor, a very vital tool for integration. Uh, this is very obvious, but unfortunately, it's not still the level of awareness is not everywhere the same. So one of the role and the, one of the first role, main objective of the uh, strategy will be to increase the awareness about the importance of uh, multilingualism. For example, in terms of employability, in terms of uh, competitiveness for the companies. Absolutely, because I was quite interested, uh, there is a paper out by European Business which says that multilingualism is a great factor for competitiveness and to improve Europe's business skills. And of course, I'm, I'm leading a, a kind of a discussion within my center, European Policy Center, on learning Chinese for European business people who go to China. They should be able to speak Chinese, for instance, and one would say people coming here should be able to speak the local language as well. So business is an important factor, isn't it? Exactly, exactly. And when we launched, because we launched this initiative in 2007, there were many people very reluctant concerning the use of many more languages in the business sector. It, uh, there were many stakeholders thinking that uh, a language is enough. A language of international communication, mm -hmm. mainly English, is enough. Mm -hmm. But this is not the case. We have clear proofs that the companies who are not able to develop linguistic strategies, to, they are not able to have enough linguistic skills, are losing businesses, are losing money. So where is the opposition coming from? People who say multilingualism, well, you know, why do we need to spend money on that it's, when English uh, is enough? Um, by s explaining that English is not enough. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's not enough from, uh, let's say, a personal perspective. Mm -hmm. In order to get a decent job, for example, in my country, Romania, one has to know at least two foreign languages. Mm -hmm. uh, but also, uh, this is the situation in many other uh, mm -hmm. member states. From a cultural perspective, being knowing uh, other languages, mm -hmm. you, one can be more open to the others, mm -hmm. can understand the others, can understand diversity and can live with diversity, mm -hmm. which is uh, still a challenge for, uh, for Europe. And also from many, many uh, other points of view. Uh, there are other stakeholders saying that, for example, uh, being multilingualism uh, or promoting multilingualism, it's a very costly mm -hmm. uh, process. It is costly. Uh, uh, partially. 
partial, mm -hmm. even at the, uh, the level of the European Union. Mm -hmm. So uh, everybody spoke about bubble tower in Brussels mm -hmm. and how much money we spend for, uh, uh, for having so many official languages, mm -hmm. 23 official languages. Mm -hmm. But in fact, uh, if uh, we are looking at the figures, it's just approximately 2.4 uh, or 5 euro per year per citizen. So mm -hmm. it's not a big, uh, mm -hmm. uh, big amount of money in order to ensure that our institutions are acting in a democratic way. There are countries in the world, I was thinking of India for instance, uh, my country of origin, Pakistan, where people speak many languages. Uh, they speak, and you know, they, they converse with each other in a national language, but English uh, they speak to each other as well. There doesn't seem to be that kind of uh, fraught uh, feeling that, oh God, you know, you have to preserve your national language, because it is preserved. It is preserved through songs, through theatre, through books, uh, through television, but people are, I would say, more at ease about speaking foreign languages. Let's look at the history mm -hmm. and let's see, and even at the recent history, the situation is so different yeah. in different member states. True. There are member states when, where the official language, the present official language of them, uh, was in the past completely forbidden and it, it, uh, it was spoken only home. So it's, we, we have to understand mm. the sensitivity, and there are a variety of sensitivity. I, I will give you just one example. Uh, I was in Slovenia before 2004, uh, before their accession to the European Union. At that time, they were very worried about the risk of losing their identity, of losing their uh, language mm. within an enlarged European Union. After now, uh, when, we, uh, when I discuss with them, uh, these concerns uh, uh, no longer exist mm. because they are confident that by having uh, the, an official recognition, Slovenian is one of the official languages in the European Union, they not only get an official recognition, but also they succeeded to have their language language preserved mm -hmm. and also promoted. This is very important. That's so we point. have to understand mm -hmm. uh, uh, the recent uh, the context, history, yeah. the context yeah. and the uh, very different situation mm -hmm. from one member state to another. Very true. I think it's mindsets and mentalities and people don't like being challenged, whether it's in their language, uh, whether it's their identity, they don't like being challenged by people from outside, languages from outside. I think people feel threatened. Uh, and I think in, in Europe we're, we're living through such kind of an identity crisis where people feel they have to cling to certain traditions, certain languages to survive in a very competitive, globalized world. But I think, uh, once again, I, I'm a true believer in youth. And I think it's the young people of today who will actually carry this forward and be the real multilinguals of, of, of Europe today.